It starts with the land. If your land base is not biologically regenerating itself and getting better and better each year, measured by all different parameters, but let's just use, you know, soil carbon or soil organic matter. If that's going down each year, um, that's not sustainable. But if you get that biological system cranked up with, you know, the carbon cycling through and the nitrogen and the water, then you've really got something that can sustain into, you know, for generations that doesn't take a lot of inputs. By treating this well, it's pulling the nitrogen out of the air and making it productive and it doesn't cost me anything. I realized over 15 years ago that soil was underappreciated. And I realize as a scientist that, you know, the whole premise of the food systems and hydrology and the biodiversity on this planet is, is reliant on soil systems. And when I personally started looking at soils in healthy natural areas, I found the highest levels of carbon reported. So, you know, very clearly in my mind was Wow, if we can restore health to landscapes, we can probably remove huge quantities of atmospheric carbon dioxide and put that back where it came from. So I've, I've realized that there's this huge opportunity to rebuild soils and rebuild ecosystems. And remember, uh, carbon is what it's all about. We're a carbon-based planet, and this is it in living color right here, right now. Three of the ranches that we're working with now had a legacy with the landscape. All of those were settled by the people or the families of the people that we're now working with. So that richness and depth of experience and knowledge of history is, is all available to us. This is a fairly conservative community that I live in. So it was a few, for about 10 years, it was a bit of a tough sled. To, and, I, and I made some mistakes because I was trying a new thing. Well, we went from traditional farming, ranching, continuous grazing, not managing the pastures and inputs, you know, chemical fertilizers and sprays and, and this type of thing. It just seemed we were just going backwards and our quality of life, you know, we didn't have a lot of balance in life. So when we quit sort of cold turkey and just jumped in, people were, were I guess, were surprised because we were known as traditional type farmers. And farmers move very slow, just like the seasons. When we started into organics, we, you know, the neighbors said a lot of things that weren't very complimentary. It was a difficult time for us, I guess, in that we somewhat isolated ourselves from our neighbors. And they did think that we were doing it for other reasons, because we'd run out of money or we'd, you know, gone bankrupt or we just couldn't afford the machinery anymore. Our biggest expense was machinery. Tom, he's not keen on machinery. Some people love it, but he loves grass, cattle. We decided that if we can do it with livestock, with a team, with a saddle horse, then that's the route we wanted to go. There's a lot of opportunity to do great things and to preserve some of this great land. So Tim, then what we're looking for is okay. uh, what we call adaptive multi-paddock grazing, which okay. other people call holistic. It's just very short rotational higher density, higher intensity grazing. Right. And what we're looking for is where you're doing that and then neighboring properties where they're doing continuous heavy stocked grazing and okay. continuous light stock grazing. We're doing this because there's been a working hypothesis that this adaptive multi-paddock grazing has the possibility of putting more soil carbon into the ground than heavy and light continuous grazing rotations. So what we're doing is we chose four ranch areas. Uh, one is the, the Tower Ranch, which is the multi-paddock grazing center near Red Deer. We're studying the Hoven Ranch, which is near Eckville. We're studying the John Cross ranches down near High River. And then we're studying the Holtman Ranch complex, which is about two hours east of Calgary. So basically the cycle of life is, is about to be measured here. What are you guys finding? It could be done anywhere. These are the luckiest places on earth. So very difficult to standardize field research. Most science is small plot research done in field trials, like at an experimental farm. And you know what's unique about our work and this work here 
is that we're working with real farmers. So we're going out there to the real commercial landscape and seeing what's happening uh, in reality. Sometimes you just gotta test it, right? You can sit around and talk about it for weeks on end or months on end. And sometimes you actually just have to get out there and try it. So Tim, what we really wanna do is check what typifies the ranch uh, and then verify it by taking a quick sample. Uh, I'll look at the soil, I'll assess it and give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And then rye will come back and actually do the production operation of taking samples where they'll go to the laboratory so that we can truly quantitatively assess what you have in terms of carbon. Okay. You know as well as anyone the importance of what's underneath is really what accounts so much for what's on top. But the soil underneath is your natural capital. It's what, right. what you inherited when you took over. So I'll just... Uh, take a bite at a time so I don't uh, mix stuff up too badly. Uh, take a look at that surface and what we got here I'll lay it in order. If we're just talking about uh, carbon for a minute uh, we'll have carbon that's labile, it's active, it's moving, it's cycling in the system and then as we have these long organic rings of, uh, of humic acids uh, they almost become permanent. This is the newest organic matter. And that's including roots, and you can see roots all the way. I mean, here's a new root. So this is active. Mm. And then we have old and decayed and dead. Um, is that a root? Yeah. Yeah, so that's down 36 inches. Mm -hmm. You bet. So my, my sense is if you build high levels of organic uh, carbon in the upper, in the topsoil, Tim, that you're, you're just starting and accelerating the process of mobilizing material deeper into the soil. Well, I'm excited to see the roots so deep. Some of these plants are 30 inches high. You know, there's as much soil activity going straight down yeah. as going straight up. So, maybe that's the first time you've had a chance to see That is the first time. Soil. So, welcome to it. <laughs> you've known it well, but here's another side of it. That's very interesting. Your whole economy is based on that, usually. It was amazing to see that uh, soil laid out in the grass and see a, you know, a 10,000 year history and how my decisions today are affecting that. John, feel that. that that's just pleasurable. Yep. Right down, it, it's silky, mm -hmm. you know, and that is uh, the carbon in there, the organic matter. I mean, really, basically, that's what we're talking about. People can call it by any other name, but that's organic matter. Yep. And if ever there was anything wrong with the, the soils of the world, it's a dearth of organic matter. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that without the nitrogen, as you say, doesn't make the system go. Yeah. So you can have uh, the most beautiful sports car, but if you don't have an engine and the fuel, yeah. it goes nowhere. You know, I'm talking a little bit about organic matter and carbon. And John says, well, hey, what about nitrogen? How does that work? And then all of a sudden, Rye says, well, let's not forget water. Yep. So what are we, we're beginning to talk about the system. And all of these things play a role. The water cycle on Earth is built on a huge quantity of water infiltrating annually. Infiltration of water means that the water enters the ground and without it entering the ground, springs and lakes and streams and wetlands don't receive what's called base flow. Base flow is cool seepage that travels below the ground and will reappear at the lowest points on the landscape, which are typically wetlands and ponds and streams. And what's happened in most of the agricultural landscapes and certainly all of the developed urban and suburban landscapes, is that the methods being used to manage the land reduce the infiltration capacity of the soil, and larger percentage of the water runs off the land and doesn't infiltrate. And that's what's contributing to flooding, you know, roads washing out, rivers eroding deeper and deeper and becoming more unstable. So what we're doing now is measuring infiltration in different ranch grazing conditions and that's going to give us a really good quantitative measurement of the differences between different grazing practices and their, their relationship with infiltrating water. You know,
know, when we had that two inches of rain here on June 4th, our land just absorbed it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was only one place, one low spot where you could see some water build up, whereas okay. all the neighbors had water line in their fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just confirmation that the amp grazing, it gets the soil working the way it should. How is the soil doing? Like, is it, are you, so is it average for no, let, let, water? No, let's tell you. Okay. So the sacrificial area? Yes. It looks like this soil here might be 10 times better at infiltrating than the soil over Ten there. Times. Yeah, we'll confirm that. I've just looked at the average infiltration rate on this unit, and in this location, uh, the soil infiltration rate compared to the heavy continuous grazed area, this amp grazed area has nearly an 80 times greater infiltration rate. So not just 10 times, almost 100 times, almost two orders of magnitude, greater infiltration rates. But that's amazing, like you get 21 gallons down that hole, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a, the land has a drinking problem, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this project may provide first time evidence of actual measured, you know, real data documenting improved infiltration, which is absolutely what the world needs. As far as I'm aware, on planet Earth, the best soil builders are the grasses. And it's usually the natives, mm -hmm. like needle and threadgrass stipas yeah. and colarias, you know, uh, June grass. Those have root systems that'll go down two to three meters, four meters. When you have native cool season grasses that go down that deep, you know, boy, they're, they're just remarkably resilient. Just like you are what you eat, yeah. <laughs> the plant materials make the soil. Well, I've been looking at grasslands for a long time and, you know, different species can have different uh, attributes which can influence soil carbon sequestration. We've demonstrated this actually from plot scale experiments where if you can change the diversity of the community, it can have an impact in carbon and nitrogen cycling. If this used to be all stipe of virigula and June grass and some of the wonderful native fescues, which had two, three meter root systems, and now it's replaced by these species, at least right in this spot, mm -hmm. with 80%, with 90% of the root mass in the upper couple of inches, what do you think's happening to the soil below that that used to be nourished and maintained by the deep-rooted plants? It's going anaerobic. That Well, usually it's deteriorating. Yeah. In, in order to maintain soils, you have to continue the inputs. My opinion is that you know we haven't paid enough attention to that. Yeah. If it's green and grows and our yeah. cattle eat it, we feel, wow, that's great. Yeah. We're onto a forage base. Two pounds a day, weight gaining. We're really happy, yeah. really cooking. Yeah. But the ecosystem isn't, isn't necessarily healthy. So it's, it's possible that these management strategies might impact on soil carbon. It's just we need to do the experiments and make the measurements to collect the evidence. So about a half an acre walk over your ground, here's about uh, 30 to 40 native wildflowers and grasses mm -hmm. that are growing just right around here. Here's about an acre walk on the uh, land across the fence. I wasn't excluding anything. This is a representation of everything on that side of the fence I could find. So uh, you, could, you just get some sense of the diversity differences. Um, this is a $25 bouquet and this is a <laughs> Two cent bouquet, <laughs> and uh, the difference here is just spectacular. But th this is remarkable to see this diversity in a pasture. And I mean, you you all know about how efficient uh, organic matter is recycled on these native grasslands. It's it's all been excavated and occupied by beetles and little uh, fly larvae and all sorts of creatures. I guess this is a cow chip. Yep. Why am I holding that? <laughs> look at, there's one. Oh, look at these. Look at them all. There's one right there. Right there. See them? See them just going down the hole? So every one of these holes, you assume there's a, probably a beetle down in there somewhere. There's another one. You can see it moving. They actually break down the manure piles. If you have the chemicals in the ground, which kills them, then the, the pile just sort of sits there and it doesn't break down, it just dries out and eventually, you know, weather will get to it. Right, Blake? That's right. 
Commercial insecticide kills them. Commercial insecticide kills them. If you ivomec your cows, you're ivomecing your dung beetles. Ultimately, soil thrives under a perennial polyculture. And we're grazers, and we manage for that. We've got perennial grasslands, legumes, there's a diversity there. And that cocktail mix acts as a soil builder, acts as a total biology builder. I hear the sounds of nature, and I hear what's going on. I hear it talk to me. And that says to me, there's life in this land. There's life in this soil. We're on the Tim Hoven farm in one of Tim's primary fields where they do adaptive multi-paddock grazing. And we're working our way from the, the, the upper reaches of a slope down to the lower areas in this field and running transects perpendicular to that. We've picked a pretty common or, or dominant soil catena on each ranch that represents uh, the amp grazing and is also represented on neighboring ranches with the heavy continuous and light continuous grazing. So here we've got a John Deere gator with a Giddings uh, hydraulic soil sampler mounted on the back and we're able to do one meter long two inch diameter soil core in a matter of seconds. And this is what in Steve's old method of doing this work should take uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. We're able to get over to a, a new point, set our anchors so the machine will stay in place as we drive the hydraulic probe in. The two inch diameter uh, of the core, it's being captured in these plastic tubes. And then we cap it with a red and a black cap. And then we've got a full uh, one meter soil core that we can send to the lab. So we're basically collecting these 30 from each field and then we'll ship them off for analysis in the coming weeks. Not bad, huh? There's so much good science and a lot of this has never been done. So we have a scientist that's working on the Towers Ranch uh, across the way. He's doing carbon pulsing in these small pulse tents. He'll be injecting CO2. The plants will be taking that up during photosynthesis. A normal carbon isotope that's in most abundance is carbon-12 he'll be injecting carbon-13. So this is a, a cylinder of pure carbon dioxide, which is 13C rather than 12C. We've got 100 litres here. Um, that's $10,000, $10,000 worth. So what's the difference between the carbon-13 and the CO2? That it's just one neutron. neutron. It's slightly heavier. Oh, on okay. the atomic scale, no. and in, so, in the atmosphere, naturally, there's about 99% of it is 12 yes. CO2, and only 1% of it is 13 CO2. So then with the, these experiments, we're kind of switching that round, and we're enriching the atmosphere in 13 CO2 to an unnatural level, mm -hmm. and then that allows us to trace that addition of carbon through the plant and then soil system. We're trying to find out how quickly carbon gets into these grasslands and where that carbon goes in the soil. And the reason we're doing that is because we know from Richard Teague's work that soil carbon increases under AMP grazing, but we don't know how quickly that happens. We don't know where that carbon goes, uh, how long it's going to be there. So it's really about getting a label into the soil so that we can effectively track that carbon and see where it's going. And literally it's kind of like you are what you eat, right? So if you eat lots and lots of cheeseburgers, you're going to put on a lot of mass and get heavier. So if you imagine instead of a, a cheeseburger, you're now eating carbon 13 instead of carbon 12, which is maybe lettuce, you're going to get heavier. And we can see that in the soil microbes, the soil fungi, the macrofauna, anything that eats any of that microbial biomass will become heavier. So you can literally follow that back up the food chain. It's a body of evidence, really. You need more data to kind of begin to change people's perceptions. To do that, we need to do experiments like this in real systems with new technologies that most people don't have access to. So we're kind of pushing the boundaries, I guess. And it's always hard to go first, right?
normal or is this forest fire haze? Forest fire. All those particles from Oregon making their way to Alberta. Especially today. Yeah. Know? A day we don't need it. I just got an email from Denver this morning that you can't see the Rockies from Denver. The smoke's so heavy there. So wow. the western side of the continent's hazy. Soil carbon to me seems a pretty good bet in terms of storage. If you're going to store carbon and not see it go up in flames and impact ecosystems a thousand miles away. You know, there's a lot of investment in forestry offsets around the world. We should plant more trees to capture more carbon. But, you know, that's only permanent as, as long as the tree's standing there. Uh, when you have, a, you know, an invasive species like the, the mountain pine beetle, Colorado, that's just sweeping its way across the continent. Again, facilitated by climate change. Um, what you had thought of as an offset is actually not really at that point. Um, forest fire in Oregon is another example, right? So it's not an offset anymore, it's in the air. But soil, it's there as long as this management stays in place. Uh, and if we can create financial mechanisms that enable landowners, farmers, ranchers to maintain that practice, then, you know, it's going to be there as long as they're there. <laughs> Would you guys be interested in selling those offsets to Shell? You prove your carbon's here and they pay you for it? You'd be a fool not to. <laughs> Especially when we're measuring it at no cost. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but you know, if, if there was the added benefit, the added financial benefit to grazing the way we're doing, that's right. I can totally see trying to transition away from some of my cropping and do more and more grazing, because grazing is what I really love to do. <laughs> it, it takes a lot to change a person's mind. Yeah. It takes a lot. So you're, so you're talking, you're measuring soil, or was that money? Money. <laughs> so it's, but some people would change because they can see the benefit to the soil. Yeah. Even without any financial benefit. But then other people, it'll come down to the, to the bottom line again. Agriculture has never been uh, a high margin activity. And anything that farmers can, can receive to increase their margin, that's how you're going to change people's behavior. shopping trip at Home Depot was quite interesting. We had all the kit required to, you know, get rid of and dispose of bodies. <laughs> Duct tape, plastic sheeting, <laughs> staple gun. The only thing we were missing was a saw. <laughs> <laughs> so the FBI, you know, probably have a automatic red flag when those items are purchased <laughs> and an asterisk, except when building pulse chase chambers. <laughs> Did you bring just one pump or two? Two. Oh, well, it fails. You've got two pumps in that. <laughs> <laughs>